everybody. Uh, I get the awesome privilege and opportunity to preach a sermonion to us here this morning. Uh, you know, we're gonna go. We're gonna go straight into a scripture here. Uh, go and turn in your Bibles to First Corinthians chapter nine. And First Corinthians chapter nine. Bro. We're going to read verse 24 to 27. Come on, Isaac. And the scriptures read here. Read it, bro. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners oh, run? Oh, 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 but only one going? gets the prize. Let him know. Let run him know. in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do oh, it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Oh. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Uh, and if you're wondering why I went to this race, as King mentioned, or uh, went to the scripture, as King mentioned, some of us, we ran a race yesterday. Uh, we went and we ran a Spartan race, specifically the Spartan Beast. Oh. Uh, and if you're wondering what the Spartan Beast, it's a 13 point, like two or three mile obstacle course with 30 obstacles in it. Light work. Uh, under the sun in San Luis Obispo. Uh, so we got to go ahead and run that. And let me tell you, I've run a marathon before. This was about as difficult, <laughs> if not slightly more difficult, if you ask at City, uh, than a marathon. Uh, it was intense, man. I, I, we, 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 we were done, and as we were like getting in the car, we were all just like, oh, like okay, like, okay, we're we're working our way there. Uh, and then we we got in the car and we were we're gonna go eat, and you just it's just like a it's like a five minute process for everyone to get like one leg out of the car, and then the other leg out of the car, and then we go and we ended up having some pizza. But even as we were there, it was just like everyone was just like. Uh, I'm, I'm glad Abby didn't post the after picture. You guys saw the before picture. Uh, but the after picture, uh, it was a different type of energy in the picture. You can definitely tell everyone was a little tired. <laughs> and uh, it was great though. And there was many, many times, even in the obstacle course, where it's like, man, I just feel like I should give up right now. I should let that medic car who's been picking people up come and get me uh, so I can go back. Uh, so I can go get my water and my snacks after you complete the race. Uh, but we did it, a lot of us. Uh, but I'm going to get more into that as we start our lesson here. And actually, what we're going to do is we're going to study out a guy in the Bible who ran the race. Uh, and he ran it well. And of course, that is Paul. And we're going to start off by going and looking at Paul's conversion. Go ahead and turn me over here to Acts chapter 9. This is awesome, bro. Come on. In Acts chapter 9, Come on, bro. we're going to read verse 1 through 9. With you, bro. Come on, Isaac. And the Bible reads here, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The man traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So, he, so they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Wow. Uh, here is an intense picture. So this is what it took to get Paul's attention, uh, to get him really converted and focused on God. And it's kind of crazy. You got to imagine, like, Paul, he's with the guys. They're ready to go persecute some people who are following Jesus. Yeah. And they, they think they're being sent totally by God. 
So they're just like, hey, we're going to go get those disciples. Like, uh-uh, they ain't going to be talking about Jesus no more after we're done. Hey, oh. uh, and they were focused. This is what their goal was. And what's crazy, again, he thought he was doing God's will wow. in doing this. And what happens? A flash of light. And it's, I just got, like, even picturing that, just like the flashlight to the point where, like, they start hearing Jesus just talk out of nowhere. And, yeah, it just makes sense to drop to the ground. Because if you read in the Bible about when angels appeared, it was usually not a good thing. Uh, but here they drop to the ground, and Jesus is like, hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to this place and wait there. <laughs> Stop persecuting me, basically. Okay. And uh, here for us, you know, I think Paul, when I think of Paul, I always think of just a very zealous guy. Right. Yeah. Even before he became a preacher of the way, which was just the first century disciples, what they called themselves. Yeah. I always looked at him as just a very zealous individual. Right. And you know what's crazy, you know, even though Paul was very zealous it, while he was serving as a Pharisee, it even just shows us like, hey, even though we believe in God, sometimes we can get zealous for the wrong thing. Uh, I think the thing that even as disciples or even people growing up in the States can really fall into is getting zealous. Like, oh man, if I just get that career, whoo, man, they're really excited about talking about the job or the career, and then they finally get it. And it's just like, well, all right, you gotta shift the focus there. Uh, but even some of us, we're super zealous about school. Oh, uh, I, know, no. I think fewer than most, actually. Yeah. Uh, but there's some people get a zeal when it comes to school. And they're just like, man, I just can't wait to be done with school. Man, this class is great. That class was great. I'm learning a lot. All this stuff. Jeremiah. Uh, you know, I think some of us, we can even get zealous about doing nothing. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you, when, I, when I'm just laying in my bed, and I'm just like there, they like got Netflix on, Netflix asked me like three times if I was watching, of course I'm watching, what are you thinking? Some of us get really excited about that. Uh, I think even those who are in the kingdom, sometimes we can lose sight of the king, or, but it, I'm sorry, we can lose sight of the king, but be more focused on his kingdom. We're yeah. like, hey, when am I going to do that sermon union, man? Oh, oh, I've been here a while. Oh, I can do Isaac. this. Wow. You know, or someone's like, man, I just, I just want to disciple someone. Oh. You know, I, just want, I want to be in charge of someone else. Someone's in charge of me. Oh. I want to be in charge of someone else. Oh. I can do that. Man, if Isaac can do that, for sure I can do that. Oh. Uh, some people are like, man, why, ha why hasn't Jacob asked me to be a Bible talk leader? Oh, oh come on, King. I got the skills, I got the scriptures, I know how to use them, you know, I, I, I share my faith, uh, I walk with God, well, amen, that's how you're, you're supposed to walk with God. Uh, we can start to get focused on a lot of these things, but truly lose sight and zeal for the person that we're supposed to be worshiping on a daily basis, just like Paul here. Well, let's continue reading and see what happens to Paul, we're going to pick up in verse 10. Come on, bro. And we're going to read verse 10 through 19. And the Bible reads here. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, uh, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, to the, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained some strength. You know, I love that here. So here, you know, Paul, blind, <laughs> in a house, on Straight Street, by the way. I think the Bible is a little funny that he's on a house on Straight Street because he needed to get his life straight with God, amen. Uh, but he's there on Straight Street. Ananias gets there. And I love how even there, like Ananias, you know, God's, kind of, God's like having a little D time with Ananias. He's like, hey, Ananias, this is what I need you to do. 
and, and a nice, and sometimes maybe you felt this way, you're like, your disciple is trying to like guide you a certain way, and you're just like, you know, I just, I just don't know if that's oh, like, God. that's my calling, or <laughs> I, I, I just don't know if that's it, or maybe it's something else, uh, but right there, and then God, God's like, and nice, hey, listen up. I'm telling you to go, <laughs> and this is what you're going to do. Come on. And Ananias, he gets his heart right, and he goes, you know, right, he's doubting. He's like, hey, man, this guy is killing people. <laughs> God, he, he's here to arrest people. Come on, bro. Uh, and then, you know, Ananias enters the house, you know, he puts his hands on him, something like scales fall from his eyes, and uh, immediately after that, you know, Paul... He gets some food, so it is important to have a full stomach. Yes. Uh, eating is good. Yes. And then we're going to read in a little bit here what he starts to do after that. But I think uh, even in our relationships with our disciples, you know, I was kind of thinking about the times Jacob had really had these harder D times with me. And I think how can I even, I can relate to Ananias in his response. Uh, you know, I remember every time Jacob says something that I, that I think is wrong, uh, or, or something that he sees in me that I don't quite see. I'm very aversive. I'm like, oh, well, you know, I, I guess I can see how you can see that. Uh, uh, you know, I just think, like, in this example, that totally wasn't the case. Uh, or, or, or sometimes, sometimes he just got to hit me over, like, the side of the head with, like, this weight, and so for me to actually get it. Uh, but let me tell you, just like Ananias, I think whatever your disciple is telling you right now, Whatever it is, it's not from your disciple. It is from God. And God is just trying to get a message to you that you need to listen to. Uh, you know, I love verse, six, verse 16. <laughs> he tells Ananias about Paul that I'm going to show this guy how much he will suffer for my name. And let me tell you, I think this past weekend, yesterday, I learned a new level of suffering. Amen, bro. <laughs> Amen. Uh, man, it was intense. I, I don't know what was harder, actually, the marathon or the Spartan race. The marathon was longer in terms of miles, but I think my body was more physically exhausted from the obstacles. Right. And uh, honestly, we get, to, we get to a point where we're all kind of suffering together. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny how we, how we suffer differently. Actually, yeah. uh, it's really funny. Uh, you know, I definitely want to applaud at City uh, yes. for just giving her a part. At City went till she should go no more. Uh, and they ended up going to the, the medical tent to take make sure our sister was okay. But she gave her heart every step of the way. Made it to mile 10, almost completed it. Uh, so I want to lift you up at City. It was awesome to see you go after it. Um, yeah. I think when we were going there, we were suffering together. Uh, Victor, Victor's so funny in his suffering. <laughs> uh, it's weird, honestly. I was kind of a little bit annoyed, but I was like, getting my heart right at the pray. I had to pray while we were running. Uh, uh, but we were going, and like, we're dead. We're like, we're to the point where like, we want to stop. Like, we're just going. And Victor's just like, you know, I wonder if this is how the Israelites felt. <laughs> he would. He would say that. He's like, you know, He's like, man, for, for 40 years like this, like, what did they eat, Like, I see why they were grumbling. Like, this is intense. Uh, and he literally, like, that was his thing. And, he, and I was like, hey, man, I know he's doing that because that's what he has to do to get himself through the races. Uh, but that, that's how he suffered. Uh, you know, I think of also King. Uh, the way King suffers. You know, I love King because King, King's going. King's like he's his body's like. I need, he was operating on like below empty, and uh, he was just going though. And he would do an obstacle. He'd give his heart, and then he needed a break. Like King was the breaker. He just needed a quick break. He, he needed to like. Let me let me let me let me stretch. Let me let me, let me stretch. Let me catch. Let me get the air in my lungs again. And then he'd get up and he'd go. And that's what he would do. Just every obstacle. And give me a little break. Uh, one time, uh, one time he actually got taken down from how bad his cramps were. Uh, but again, he just needed that break, and then he got back up and he did it. And Kay ended up completing the race. Oh, let's go! Um, you know, I think of Matthew Watts. At, at, as we were all suffering, Matthew was waiting for us at the finish line. <laughs> 
he, he, he finished in almost half the time that the rest of us did. Um, so Matthew was just wondering, like, where'd the car go? Because Abby had moved it mid-race. Uh, so Matthew was pretty good. In his suffering, he was probably just like, hey, I'm just going to finish soon. So uh, let's just finish. Uh, and, and me, I think part of the reason when I'm, when I'm, when I'm suffering, part of the reason I was struggling with Victor is because... Uh, I'm very just focused. I'm just like, no, I know what I gotta do, and I just gotta do it, and we're just gonna go. And, uh, and I gotta stay like in my zone, in the head like that, because I'm just, I just can't stop. I just can't stop. And so every time Victor would say something, he's like distracting me from that focus. I'm, like, I'm gonna walk like a little more over here, so I don't know. Uh, but in my suffering, I just get focused. Come on, bro. And I love it. And that's what Paul, and that's what uh, God tells Ananias is going to happen to Paul. That he is going to learn how much he's going to suffer for his name. And you know what's crazy? It's the same thing for everyone here this morning. Come on, bro. Let me tell you, if your Christianity has been comfortable, if it, is, if it has been a very nice, you know, I wake up Sunday, I attend that church service, cool, we're there for an hour if we're lucky. Okay, if they go over an hour, like an hour and a half, two hours, Okay, you know, but then like Monday or Monday through Saturday you go and like you just have no focus on God whatsoever. That is not what God expected in Christianity today. So let me tell you, if you're here and if you're suffering for Christ, guess what? You're actually doing Christianity. Yeah, so again, if you're suffering, it is good. And, uh, you know, I love it here. We're going to pick up in the, in the Bible here in a bit here. But I love that Paul ate stuff. And once he ate, he actually begins to preach, as we're going to read here in a bit. Uh, he begins to preach. And uh, Socrates, uh, one of the quotes that he said was, Let him who would move the world first move himself. Uh, and it's so true, I think even biblically, for God. Like if someone wants to be used by God, it first starts with yourself. Like, what is it that God is trying to show you in yourself that you need to repent of? Or what sin has been bogging you down that you kind of have gotten comfortable with? So maybe you don't even get as open as you should about it. You know, what is it as you're studying the Bible that is so scary? That you're just like, oh my gosh, like if I actually do this Bible thing? Like, oh man, I don't know what this person's going to think of me. I don't know what that person's going to think of me. Man, I don't even know if I can do it knowing me. Right. Let me tell you, if you go and you persist through that, right. God is telling you, like, hey, he has the plans for you. Right. Right. Come on, bro. And um, let me tell you, Victor said this on Friday, and I, I agree with him 100%. There's nothing cooler than preaching God's word. It's true. Yeah. Uh, there is nothing cooler than getting into a Bible study and helping someone in their relationship with God. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I think about all the times that I felt super excited or fired up. And I, I do tend to think of all the sports, uh, whether yeah. it's basketball, football, baseball. I do even tend to think of like the Spartan races that I've accomplished or the marathon. None of it compared. None of it compared. And even to even like, yeah, finishing school, getting a great career. And I, I thought when I got that career, I was like, hey, we're good. Like, whatever I'm struggling with, like, there's enough money in the bank that I can just, like, throw the money at it, and that problem's gone. Uh, and that's a scary place to be. Yeah. And uh, here, it's just like, okay, no. Hey, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to struggle, it is going to be for God. And let me tell you, when you get there and you learn these lessons and you start helping someone else, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Uh, it's different. You know, I... Uh, when I was in L.A., I think I told you guys one time, I reached out to a guy in L.A., and he ended up getting baptized like uh, four or five months ago. Come on, bro. He actually texted me three days ago. I haven't talked to him <laughs> since I reached out to him. Uh, he texted me like three or four days ago, and he's just like, Hey, bro, uh, I know I haven't reached out to you at all, but I just wanted to say thank you for reaching out to me and helping me get my life right with God. Uh, I really appreciate it. Come on. And I was just like, <laughs> uh, and honestly like yeah i was just down there in la i was just you know i love god i was like hey bro you should love god <laughs> and uh he did and he went after it so when you share your faith when you open your mouth when you get into that bible study 
you never know how much you're going to impact someone's life. Right. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to Christianity here, I think uh, you can kind of find yourself in a position where you kind of start to pick and choose what you like. Uh, you know, if you've been going, you're just like, hey, man, I really like this church. Because, uh, and obviously I'm not talking about this church because we don't have any of this, but like, hey, the fog machines are great. Uh, it adds to the effect on stage. Let me tell you, like, we're over here singing songs. I don't even see song books, but let me tell you, like, man, the, the two big screens that have the lyrics going across the screens, like, man, this place is awesome. Uh, you know, if you like the band, if the reason why you're going to church is because the band is so great, like, let me tell you, there's something wrong there and I think what's funny is we kind of fall into this position uh, where we look at God and we look at his church and whatever we got to do and we kind of treat it more like a gym uh, you know where you go to a gym and you go inside you know, right, cool I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that uh, some people even at times go to a gym and then don't even really do anything walk around and talk to people and then they leave <laughs> oh, come uh, on Jordy yeah. <laughs> I think how we got to start to look at God in the Bible is more like this. You know, some of you, when you go order food, oh, you, know, wait a minute. you know, you go order food, you get your food delivered to you, and if something is missing, oh, if you're missing your fries, oh, or if you're missing your drink, or if they didn't give you the two burgers like you wanted, it's like, okay. All right, I'm going to go to that register. Let's go, McDonald's. You know, you try to compose yourself on the way to the register <laughs> so you don't seem like you're too angry. Uh, so you got like, okay, uh, you're angry. you like lose heart for a second, super angry. You get to the register, you're like, hey, uh, you're, you're, you're missing my fries? Uh, and uh, can I see the receipt? <laughs> Two fries. Uh, yeah, because why? Because you want the full meal. Well, in the same way, what we need to learn to want is the full Bible. Uh, it's no longer about picking and choosing. I think anytime you hear the words like faith alone, grace alone, or anything alone, that is not the full meal. Like, that is literally only going in just to order the fries. That's a snack. It's a snack. And let me tell you, you need the grace. You need the faith. But let me tell you, there's a lot more in the Bible that you also need if you're going to follow, call yourself a follower of Christ. So, that was the first point there. Uh, the second point. Uh, run to get the prize. You know, I think about Paul, and I think about everything that he did and that he accomplished, and... Uh, I don't have time to go over all these scriptures, but to run through them, I think of Paul, like, what made Paul the person to follow? You know, the guy said, who, the guy who said, imitate me as I imitate, imitate Christ. Right. Right. Uh, you can jot some of these down. In Romans 1, verse 1, he opens it up simply with, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, come on. What separated Paul? One, he was a servant. You know, I, I, growing up in the church, it's kind of funny. I love the kingdom, and I love the church. Yeah. Come on, bro. Uh, and even within God's kingdom, like, other than loving God, you can start to get, like, a reputation about yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you were to ask someone about someone else, uh, it, it, you, you kind of hear what people say. Uh, I think the biggest thing, actually, I think the thing that used to bother me a lot, I think at first I thought it was cool when I first came into the kingdom. But I slowly started to not like it, and I wanted to change it. Uh -huh. uh, but when I came into the kingdom, everyone said, Isaac is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaac is super cool. And like, that continued for like six months. And then a year. And then a year and a half. And then two years. And it was literally like, yeah, Isaac is super cool. But I think now in like my way of thinking, is like, man, I don't, I don't want to be cool. <laughs> like, I want the description to be of me as Paul was a servant of Christ. Wow. Or someone who was really about their purpose. Uh, someone who was very God-focused, who was driven to please God. I didn't want to be described as cool anymore. I was like, man, I want to be like Paul. I want to be a servant. Come on, bro. You know, maybe some of us still like that. Some of us are like, hey, I like to be cool. 
I like to be known for my great voice on, in the Robert. church. Oh, okay. Or I really like to be known for the fact that I bring the chairs to service. Or I set up the tripod. Oh, or I'm the sports guy. I'm the athlete. Or I'm the person who gets good grades in school. Or I'm the smart guy. I think we got to do a better job imitating Paul and just being more of a servant for Christ. Oh, Amen. Uh, you can jot this one down too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, you know, the two qualities that Paul displays here is he's very discerning and he sets a great example. Yeah. Uh, whoever Paul was talking to, like he was very wise with his words. Yeah. You know, he even says, you know, to the Jew I was a Jew, to the Roman I'm a Roman, to the Gentile I'm a Gentile. He was very smart with how he talked and who he was around. Yeah. And I think we are kind of a younger church, yeah. but I think yeah. even as a younger church, we have to start watching how we say it. Yeah. And even how we say it. Uh, because let me tell you, for some of you, whatever you do in class, here in the kingdom, at your jobs, you're the only example of the Bible that some people will ever see in their life. Right, bro. So how you conduct yourself is the way someone would view a Christian. Come on. So use that discernment and be that example. You know, I think in Galatians 1, verse 3 through 5, the thing that Paul knew, he knew he was sent by God. And he was just like, man, this is, this is, I am sent by God. Jesus himself sent me. This is what I'm here to do. And he was very unified with the spirits, with God, with Jesus in purpose. Come on. And let me tell you, when you're unified with God in that way, nothing else matters. Yep. Nothing else matters. Uh, if you're just really focused on, okay, here's what I'm here to do. Okay, I love God. First, foremost, absolutely. Okay, now I gotta help someone else love God. And if you find yourself like, man, hey, this church thing is getting a little tough. Like, okay, yeah, I go to Sunday service. I go to Bible talk. I go to my midweek when it's my midweek turn. Uh, if you're on campus, okay, I go to Devo. All right, cool. Okay, sometimes we have Saturday things, and I know it's not really a meeting of the body, but I'm gonna get my heart right because I gotta go there because the whole meeting, the family's gonna be there. Yeah. And if you find yourself, don't get me like I can find myself there. If you find yourself thinking that way, like, you gotta just connect back to what really matters. Yeah. Come you on, have bro. to connect, connect back to your relationship with God, and you have to connect the, connect back with just being a unified in purpose with our Creator. Yeah. On, that's what Paul did in Galatians, and that's what he was writing them to do. Uh, in Ephesians 1, verse 4. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And also Ephesians 4, verse, or Ephesians 3, verse 19. You can jot those down. Um, when Paul did something, he knew God chose him. Uh, that's what you learn in Romans 1. In Ephesians 3, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, verse 4. In Ephesians 3, verse 19. The second thing was, Paul, when he felt a lot, First thing he did was drop to his knees to pray to God. Come on. Uh, you know that first part? He knew he was chosen, and he ran like someone who was chosen by God. Yeah. And I think sometimes, even as those who are trying to follow Christ, and we're really committed, and we're fully just in it, we can doubt. Yeah. Like, yeah. man, am I God's chosen guy? Yeah. Am I God's chosen woman? Mm. Like, why am I in this class at Sex State right now? Or why am I here at this workplace right now? You know, why does God have me at 85 degrees? Oh, I've been here for so long. Uh, you know, and, uh, and there's a reason. It's because God wants you to reach out to someone there and help them have a relationship with him. Uh, so run chosen. Let me tell you, if you're doubting yourself right now, don't. Because God doesn't doubt you. Uh, I think for the men, for the women, we're going to move Sacramento. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do great things here. Yeah. You know, if you haven't been seeing the results that you want to see quite yet, it's okay. Maybe God is just teaching you perseverance. Yeah. And Talk just around it. that corner, you're going to see the fruit of your effort. Yeah. So just run as someone who was chosen by God. Yeah.
Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Preach it. You know, in Philippians 1.21, if you didn't notice, I'm kind of going over all the letters that Paul wrote to these churches that helped him run the race. Uh, Philippians 1.21, Paul considered his life nothing. Wow. Nothing. If only to live for Christ. And uh, I love that. It is, I, that's one of the most challenging scriptures for me, honestly. Uh, to consider my life nothing, just that I would live for Christ. Yeah. And it's very challenging. I mean, I do struggle with pride in a lot of different areas of my life. You, and I'm always trying to, like, kill that. Uh, I think my roommates know this more than anyone else. I they sure do. Um, but it's definitely something I'm trying to kill. But I, the biggest thing is, like, yeah, I just want to be someone who sets the example of what it means to lay their life down for God. And I think a lot more of us here need to make that decision that the life that I live is going to be a life that displays laying my life down for God. Let me tell you, when you do that, life is easier, honestly. Uh, Not as much stuff worries you as it used to. All the little things that kind of bothered you here and there, they suddenly seem to not matter because now you're just like, hey, I'm unified with God, I'm unified with Christ. My life, amen, I'm fired up, I'm alive. But hey, when I get to die and I go to glory to be with God forever, man, that's where my treasure is. Yeah, come on, bro. You know, I think of over here in Colossians 3, uh, where it starts to talk about set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Let me tell you, you set your mind on earthly things, you know, a car, uh, the money, the bills, uh, the degree, all that stuff. You can get it all or fix those problems. You know what's going to be waiting for you to ride around the corner? What? Another problem. (laughs) Another problem. So there is no point in getting worried about all these things that are bogging you down right now. Uh, what God wants you to do is to set your mind on things above. Where is your focus? And that's something I got to check myself with all the time, too. Uh, because when I start getting worried or I start getting bogged down or all this stuff, I think my natural inclination isn't to get focused on things above. It's like, I want to fix this now. Who do I got to talk to? Uh, I'm going to talk to them here. Uh, what, 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 what has to fall into place for something to work out? And I start doing things all on my own will. Wow. Uh, but what God is teaching us here is that, hey, we actually have to focus on Him, yeah. on things above. And again, watch what happens if you actually start to put this into action. Right. Watch God take care of every need that you have. You know, I think the biggest thing, and we're going to go to this scripture because it's so awesome. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing that Paul did to show how to run the race was he was bold. Go there, bro. Uh, he was really bold. Turn me over here to Acts 26. Okay. Come on. 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 And here, you know, Paul, at this point, uh, he gave his trial before Festus, and now he's brought before King Agrippa. So he has King Agrippa and Festus there with him, and he just gave a very convicting testimony uh, that was very wise in how he delivered it. And here's where we find him in Acts 26, 24 to 29. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time, You can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. 
Come on. Paul was gold. Yep. You know, Paul here, he's before, he's on trial. Uh, and honestly, when you're on trial, you kind of naturally want to say all the things that are going to get you, like, let loose. Yeah. But Paul's like, hey, even this is an opportunity to share my faith, share my convictions, and convert someone who is a very powerful figure. And even, I, I love it, like, Agrippa's just like, dude, who do you think you are? <laughs> like, do you think you can convert me into a Christian? And then I love, I just love Paul's response. It honestly fires me up every time I read it. He's like, hey, whether short time or a long time, not only you, but every person that's here. And Paul was absolutely bold in his race with God. Yeah. You know, it didn't matter who it was. If he, if he was to be brought before Caesar, he would do it. And then over here in Acts 28, verse 30, the last thing Luke records here in Acts 28, verse 30. It says, For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Yeah. Here, as he's on house arrest, uh, even under house arrest, they couldn't stop Paul from preaching about Jesus. Yeah. You know, people came to his house, and they're in the house. Hey, and I, if you, I gotta imagine, like if like someone's under house arrest, they're probably gonna do less of what got them to be arrested. Yeah. That wasn't the case with Paul. You know, he got arrested for just proclaiming Jesus Christ, and he actually still continued to proclaim it. Uh, he didn't care. And to the point where like they got there and he's still uh, converting people. That's a bold guy who can't be stopped. And it is someone who we need to imitate here this morning. Come on, bro. Come on. Uh, you know, I kind of think about that, guys. And even like as I was preaching this and thinking about all the ways uh, that Paul was a great Christian. How he set the example. How he ran that good race. Uh, how much he preached for Christ. Yeah. And honestly, I even think about all the ways that I have fallen short about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't always ran in a way that was going to get me close to the prize. Yeah. Um, you know, I think my pride is something that is like super ugly that I think I've gotten a lot better at recently. Uh, but I remember as a young Christian, like, man, if someone tried to disciple me on something, I, I, did, I wouldn't hear it. Simply because I didn't want to hear it. If someone tried to challenge me in the Bible, I wouldn't hear it. Simply because I just didn't want to hear it. And so my pride was something that I think, like, man, it kept me in the way from running, running the good race. Um, and even as I started to get a little more godly focused, I think some of the ways I started to fall short now was selfish ambition. Uh, where it's like, I wanted to see me grow in God's kingdom. I wanted to be the person leading the Bible talk. I wanted to be the person preaching. I wanted to be the person in uh, the SF Chronicle with the picture of the baptisms where you're like, yeah. there's a guy right there. Uh, and even I was like, man, I, I, I want to be in the Good News email. Before they had the Good News Network videos, it was a Good News email. And uh, they used to have pictures in there. And it just became totally all about me. Me. Yeah. Me. What position am I going to get? What am I going to get noticed for? Who's going to lift me up? And that's what my sometimes, or that's definitely something that I have fallen short with. You know, I start to even think of, uh, you know, young Isaac and just the sin that he struggled with. You know, I made a lot of dumb decisions as a young disciple. You know, in my first few months, uh, I think drunkenness, sexual, to my shame, sexual immorality, uh, and it was a lot of dumb stuff. I think honestly, it all came from this last one, which was my independence. Uh, I wanted to do what Isaac wanted to do. Not Ramos, Isaac, me, Isaac. Uh, I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Yeah. And if something was going to cause me a little uncomfort, I wouldn't do it. Simply because I cared too much about what I thought. 
And I remember all the times even that they would like, <laughs> the brothers, uh, I didn't move into a brother's household right away, uh, which was just a group of guys in the church living together. Um, but they would always ask me to go over. Always. <laughs> always ask me, Isaac, you should come over, hang out. Come spend the night, Isaac. Like, it's going to be totally cool. Yeah, come on, Isaac. Uh, it's going to be great. Hey, like, even over time, like, move in. This is going to be awesome. Every time I was met, it, it was met with the hard no. 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to spend the night. I don't want to hang out. And what did that lead to? Me drifting further and further away from living out the Bible and what it's calling me to do. Um, and I got to the point where I was like, dang, okay. I see like my independence, it's gonna kill me. If I continue to operate on how I want to operate, I won't be with God for very long. Uh, if I don't start to kill my selfish ambition, I'm not going to be with God for very long. If I don't start to kill my pride and be humble and allow people in my life to help guide me through the scriptures, I won't be in the kingdom very long. You know, another quote from an unknown author, it says, growth, and that's really what discipleship is, is helping you grow for God. Growth is often uncomfortable, messy, and full of feelings you weren't expecting. Yeah. But it is necessary. Yeah. Come on. And I think as we get ready to take communion here, let's start to reflect on a lot of these ways that we need to grow in. Uh, maybe it is the pride just like me. What is the selfish ambition, the independence? Uh, maybe if you're just wrestling with the scriptures and maybe the person who invites you out to study the Bible, that's like a, something that's super challenging for you to see in the scriptures. But even start to wrestle even there for the guidance to make a biblical decision. Um, but as we pray for communion, let's reflect on those ways. Ways we've fallen short, Jesus. Uh, ways, areas we need to grow in. Um, but as we get ready to do that, uh, let us pray for communion. Thank you.